and I've had the, the the pleasure to get to know Jason over the last I don't know six or so months since he um, moved to Columbus um, from where he's been uh, the CTO of GitHub virtually. Um, and he, as he'll share in his background, he's been doing work for home uh, from home for a long, long time. Though that's and for a lot of us a, a, a pretty new thing. Uh, but he also uh, serves on the board of one of our portfolio companies, Fizna. So with that, hand it over to you, Jason. Um, give us a, a bit of context on your background, sure. uh, and and then we'll we'll kick off from there. Sure. So um, so quick background uh, on me. Um, as Robert said, I've been doing um, remote or distributed exec management now, going over ten years. Um, right, I, right now, I'm at GitHub. I'm the CTO at GitHub. I've been there just about three years at this point. Um, prior to that, I ran engineering and product and security for Heroku, um, which was part of Salesforce at the time. Um, and then before Heroku, I ran Ubuntu Linux for a company called Canonical out of the UK. And I started that job in the middle of nowhere, Australia, believe it or not. And then I continued to do that while I moved to Victoria, British Columbia. Um, I spent five years in Victoria and then from Victoria, had a quick stopover in Bellevue, but then moved to Columbus um, June of last year or so. So I've never lived in San Francisco, even though I work for some San Francisco based companies, um, been doing remote stuff now going on 10 years and, um, basically wanted to help people who are going through a rather sudden and jarring transition to distribute and remote as best I can and really have no agenda other than to talk here about what's most pressing on your minds, whether it's either questions or topics or, um, things of that nature. And, um, you know, offer any sort of either tactical, like immediately tactical things that we could do or more longer leads like type things. Like how do we communicate? How do we uh, organize ourselves? How do we plan as an example? Um, any of those things um, are on the table and quite, quite literally, I want it all to be about what is most pressing for you all um, in doing this. And Jason, it's not just that you've been remote in your CTO or leadership duties. It's it's a lot of these companies you've worked for have been remote first workplaces. In yes, cases. actually, all three of them were. They're all remote first. It, um, sometimes I forget some of the things that I should go without saying in one environment, don't in another. Um, yeah, we uh, uh, Canonical was 100% distributed, except for their design team, which is um, housed in um, Bluefin office in the UK. Heroku was over 70% distributed with uh, two executives in San Francisco, the rest throughout the country. And GitHub was, uh, when I joined, about 65% distributed and now has only in actually increased that number because of uh, Microsoft has offices around the country. And then once we take over a Microsoft division or bring them in-house to, to GitHub, all those people just basically scatter to their homes so they become a distributed member of GitHub as well. Awesome. Well, uh, let's start really with the basics. Um, so for a lot of these companies, uh, ourselves included at Drive, this is the first time we're working from home. What are some of those low hanging fruit best practices um, that go into making sure teams are engaged, aligned and, and productive? Um, the easiest answer to give to that question is gonna be about tooling. Um, but I assume that most people here have already done some of those and I can go into to, to tools and those things later. Though I um, offer that the most important kind of low-hanging fruit thing you could do is try to find the fastest way to make sure everyone in the company knows what they're doing every day. And if you can get to that point where everyone is organized in such a way that your information flows, that everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing that day and why, um, a lot of the other stuff gets kind of filtered out. Now that's not low-hanging fruit, but I think about um, you know boulders, rocks, pebbles, sand scenario. That's definitely the boulder that if you're a CEO or CTO in an organization, you should be thinking about on a regular basis. That's the big one. Um, though, um, in a low-hanging fruit sort of way, make sure that people understand um, maybe the next time horizon until you can figure out how to do all those things. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month, maybe it's two weeks. But just but to get that locked down, and the easiest way to do that is send a really quick email about what everyone should be focused on, you know, top two or three, four or five bullet points, uh, why it's important, and then what cadence you're going to be checking in, making sure that those things are happening. Super simple, really straightforward, lightweight. 
sounds like communication best practices under any circumstances, but with extra effort over communication because people are, are remote. Well, the, um, the way I look at this is what makes or breaks a remote company, a distributed company is all about communication. But the techniques that make a remote company a good company are actually the things that make a co-locate a co-located company, an excellent company. They're all the same things that you should be doing already over here, but you can get away with not doing them as a co-located company because you can just walk up to somebody or you could see them in the office or you can cheat code your way around certain things. You can't do that in a distributed environment. So you're forced to you basically reckon those things together. And so communication is literally the single most important thing that you can do in a distributed company. Um, I contend it's still one of the most important things to do in a co-located company, but it's a non-negotiable in a distributed company. And, and, and you're, are you talking about not just CEO, C-level down, but really throughout any communication structure, uh, managers, directors, anybody who's got a team anybody, should be doing this? And here's, here's the way I, I look at this. Let me give it a little bit of a construct. Can everyone see the video? I know I don't see everyone, but I'm assuming everyone can see me. So. And forgive me, I'm gonna use my hands, I'm one of those people. But um, imagine you're the CEO of an organization and you go back to what I said earlier, which is your job is to make sure that everybody in the company knows what they should be working on every day. Um, if it's an engineer or a marketer or a salesperson, you know they know what they're doing, why they're doing it, for whom they're doing it, all that sort of stuff. Well, if you're the CEO and you're up here in the upper, in, in my video, upper left-hand corner, you're basically going to try to figure out a way to communicate all the way down to that engineer or salesperson or marketer and then get feedback status on the projects all the way back up to you. And if you look at that, it's basically a V. And your job, again, over here is to communicate. Write it down, communicate it, email it, put it into a Slack, do whatever you need to do, but make sure everyone along the chain, as you mentioned, Robert, you, know, you the CEO, the VPs, the directors, the managers, know what they're communicating down and why and interpreting that context for them. And then on the pathway back up that V, it's all about status updates. Well, how's it going? What's blocking you? Who is responsible for bringing the update? Who is responsible for bringing it out to the rest of the organization? And if you think about that V pathway of communication, the narrower those Vs are to a vertical line, the better you are as a company. And the further away they are, the worse you are as a company. So if you get to a horizontal line, you're pretty poor company. You're a CEO who basically doesn't know how to broadcast or get status updates. You have no idea. You're flying blind. Now, and theoretically, the vertical line is impossible to get to. So basically, you're trying to get to as small a, a, vec um, uh, a vector gap as possible. Um, and the way I think about doing this in, 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 in the best of cases, you're trying to figure out what you are doing as an executive, what you're communicating, how you're doing it, how you're overly communicating, and, and you know the, the cadence by which you're doing it. Um, and I'll stop there because I'm not sure if that's resonating with people, but, um, I can go to deep, deeper into details as well. Yeah. So those are some of the best practices. What are some of the easy pitfalls or, or where do you see teams go wrong? Uh, the, the classic mistakes. I, I think in a distributed company, what people assume is that, um, saying something once is sufficient. I mean, I don't believe that to be the case in general when it comes to executive management. But particularly in a remote environment, if you just send an email and you, you want to assume that the email or the Slack message or the GitHub issue or whatever basically says, okay, now everyone knows. Assume that you, you have fidelity loss of 70% instead. Don't assume 100% understood it, but assume fidelity loss of 70% and your goal is to get that up to 100%. So you're gonna to have to overly communicate three, four, five times in different modes. An email once, a Slack a different time, a video all hands with your company or your management team or a skip level, but just assume that you're having fidelity loss in your communications and you need to come and have more of those. The other thing I think um, to not assume is that everyone fully understands your context. Now your job is to convey your context, but people are not going to have your information. Communication we know is an imperfect mechanism anyway, I am trying to convey abstract thoughts in my head to somebody else via words, which is the weirdest thing when you start thinking about it. Well, in a distributed environment in human organizations and with layers, assume another fidelity loss each time that message gets conveyed. 
you've got to overly communicate all the time. And this is vitally important in a distributed company. And uh, you mentioned a few tools, email, Slack. What, what is the, um, you know, sort of bare bones, at least, necessary set of tools? You talked about tooling at the very beginning. Uh, and, and maybe not specific to just engineering teams, though that's a big part of, of yeah. our company's staff. I think there's, there's four basic tools that I recommend people think about. And a couple of them are, are, are basically essentials and a couple are nice to haves. But think about it this way. I, I think that email and video like this are basically the must haves in the dis distributed environment. I think video on, if you're doing um, some sort of a, uh, a meeting with everyone so you can understand the, the social mannerisms and email. So basically you're trying to do some sort of async communication with written context and then as close as you possibly could get to in person. And then the spectrum in between adds two more, which is something like GitHub, which I call institutional memory, or, and then Slack. And then on the spectrum of like must to nice to haves, I think email and video are must haves. GitHub, GitHub is pretty much necessity. Although if you think about outside the bounds of um, uh, engineering teams, it's pretty nice to have. And then Slack is a luxury. The mistake I see people making here though is using the tools inappropriately. They're gonna to try to do it, uh, um, an exclusive audio uh, video update and they're gonna to try to say, here's what we're going to be doing and they don't write something down. Writing down is the most important habit to take there, not the video update. Video is where you actually go into the nuance of what is already written down so someone can have consumed it. Or they use, this is the worst one I think people do, is they use Slack as institutional memory. Slack or async chatty type of communication is not institutional memory. It, you can't go back and you can't find it easily when you need to, um, to, to, to really you know, go back and, and say, hey, we made a decision, here is the, the decision around it. Slack, uh, in my opinion, um, over, uh, having done this for 10 years, should be used for basically throwaway conversations. Anything that you never have to reference again. And if you make a decision in Slack, find a person who is going to take that decision, ratify it, write it down, and put it into your institutional memory for basically memorialization at that point. Um, and I just hit upon something else I think is pretty important. Um, in general, good company hygiene, but in remote too, is um, there's a, a model that Apple has called DRY, which is directly responsible individual. There's a method in um, classic project management called um, RACI, R-A-C-I, which is the responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed person on any project. When it comes to uh, distributed and remote, decision-making is very, very, very important. So who makes the decision? But even more important than who makes the decision is who communicates out to the rest of the organization of that a decision has been made. And why the RACI model is very interesting to use is that it accounts for a broad set of people and, and different inputs into that project management structure, which is who is responsible for making the decision or, or communicating the decision or responsible for the project, who's accountable for the outcome, who is consulted on the project or making a decision and who is informed of a decision. And understanding the modes in which people operate also gives you a high degree of, of comfort because it shows you who needs to be involved and in which way. Not everyone needs to be involved in every decision, not everyone needs to be even updated on every decision, but you have to understand what role people are playing. In a distributed yeah. environment, again, you know, it's important. And how do you, how, how do, you do that? Like, is it a, is it a, a series of, of letters after someone's name and an email signature? What, what are the things that identify? Because that may change from project to project, right? It, it does. It absolutely will change project to project. Um, I, well, you know, what I do um, and have done from um, an engineering product perspective, and I typically, we do, you know, Trello boards or we do planning that way, Kanban style, all that stuff, et cetera, et cetera. I just have the roles actually called out in each one of those. I say, hey, Sally is a responsible person. Johnny is in all the legal is consulted and in the executive team plus sales team is informed of this decision. It's pretty straightforward. You can, everyone can see it at a glance, who is responsible who is accountable, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think being as transparent as possible is a really good habit to get into when it comes to those things. Um, I do think that if you're gonna do it in email, be very explicit. If you're gonna do it in a meeting, be very explicit. Hey, what are the actions out of this? Okay, you own it. We, what's your next step? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. The next step for the person who owns it is going to be to write down the fact that they own it, put it in a Trello or something 
or, or GitHub issue or whatever, but memorialize it and start tracking it. So uh, how do you, there's a pitfall that reminds me of like, how do you, you know, in a face-to-face -face environment, co-located environment, um, it's easy to, to, to see and know people are working, but in a remote distributed environment, you have to trust and assume they're working on the things they're supposed to be doing. And, and, and this over communication and explicit um, uh, assignment of responsibility yeah. helps, but how do you not fall into the trap of, of micromanaging yeah, well, um, in a remote context? Because it so, seems like that would be a trap a lot of managers would step in. So I'll back up one second and say that the worst of the human behavior in a remote environment is likely to come out. Um, so if you're an overly anxious person or group, you're likely to be overly anxious in a remote environment and, you know, micromanaging, um, all that sort of stuff. But if you're a micromanager, you're likely to be a, whatever the mega version of a micromanager is in a remote environment. Let me go back to that V. That V, that communication pathway actually is the, the solution to that. Because if you've got proper communication channels and proper project management back up, you get the fact that people are working on these things because you see the progress, you see the results, you see the outcomes. If you don't have that in place, you're basically trying to find other, other methods to get that information out. Now I'll make a pretty bold statement in this and that the symptom of a micromanager typically is someone who doesn't know how to do their job in the first place. It's exacerbated again in a remote environment. So if, there is a tendency to overly micromanage just because at a scale that they're operating, they don't know how to get the information, give and get the information that they need to get to do their jobs well. So let's go back to solutioning right now. So how would you do that? Well, obviously you would have wanted to put that V in place a long time ago and have your company operating and running that way. But let's say you're new and you're forced into this now because of this. Well, the easiest thing that you could do is take a chunkable time frame and block that off and say, in this time frame, we need to achieve X, Y, and Z and get everyone on the same page and do semi-regular check-ins. So whether at a company level, a team level, or a department level, you basically are going to pick a chunk of time. I recommend a week or two, and you're basically running sprints. You're saying, okay, on a Monday, we're going to start saying what we're going to achieve by this Friday. And then on Wednesday, we're going to do a quick check-in. Now the, that, that, allows you to not have to sway too far off course and then you will slowly tune that organization over time. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and it, it reminds me, I think we, something we brushed over is in that feedback side of the V, there's an assumption, not only that there are check-ins or status updates, but that there's measurement yes. uh, across the organization, that you, there's telemetry already built in where some companies might be light on that um, and and, I think and if you're a two feel, feel like they're flying blind organization. So I think um, the most um, the easiest way to find gratification in terms of feedback is to see demonstrable um, outputs. So whether it's code um, working and you can demo it, or obviously sales closing, or marketing campaigns uh, bringing in leads, think about that. And that's what I encourage everyone to think about is what is the outcome? What is the output? And then work backwards to show what are some discrete things that show that those things are actually happening. So um, a good example of that would be uh, each week I encourage my teams to have video demo demos ready to go of the output of that week for their teams for, from an engineering perspective. Um, but I also say, well, how many PRs merged? How many, um, uh, security checks flowed, how many builds passed, how many deployments got rolled back. Those are some other metrics you can put in place. But at the very minimum, I want to see a video demo happening of what you're, you're, that team worked on. Because that's kind of the safety net mechanism of, for that. You don't have to do it all the other stuff, but as long as that one happens, I feel okay for the week, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and it, it, it seems like an easier assumption, a fairer assumption for sales and engineering organizations to have that telemetry in place. Um, but for other organizations, it sounds like other parts of the organization, it sounds like if that's not in place, it's one of the, on top of the communication toolkit, there's a, uh, a measurement and telemetry toolkit that needs to be built. If, and if not, that there are these, um, the, these actions you can take, these, these rituals you can practice that fill the gap. Yeah. And think of it this way too. Imagine, um, a BD organization. 
Um, I'm not sure how big the, the, the companies here are, but um, if you get to a sufficient size and you've got a, a pretty sophisticated BD organization, there could be weeks of no deals getting done, no partnerships being made, whatever. But if you had a st if you if you got to a Friday and you wanted to say, hey, what did we all accomplish this week? There is a way that you could partake uh, compartmentalize that information to show that stuff was progressing. It's in a sales organization they know this because they know they got different stages of deals. But a lot of organizations haven't actually gone through and done that. But just think about it, what a weekly write-up would look like. Imagine that all of the BD organization wrote their accomplishments for the week and then just sent it out to the rest of the organization. That's their video demo. And, it, and that update might be, did not land Google, but we progressed the conversation from totally exploratory to now we're going to give them a demo next week of this product and we're going to see that happening. That shows progress at least. Changing gears a little bit, how, how important is, is video? I know um, there's a lot of muscle memory around chat apps, um, obviously email. Uh, everybody's starting to learn Zoom, um, if, if not for the first time, spending a lot more time in it or Google Hangouts. What, how important is face-to-face is, is -face versus I think, phone? Um, yeah, so I think um, the longer you do this, the more you realize why video is so important. And I'm not sure if you all been listen to me in the background while you're scrolling Twitter or whatnot, but I try to be overly expressive with my facial expressions and my mannerisms. And the reason why is because we have some fidelity of loss in uh, communication that's happening because we're not face-to-face -face here. Robert and I have met, I, I think Robert and I and Fro and Mark, I see Mark's name over here, probably the only people that I've met on this call. But I hope I'm giving everyone a sense for one, who I am, kind of my mode and the mood I'm in just by the way I'm talking here. Now they have a, they have some cheat with me because they we've met, we've met in person, we've had a couple of different conversations, but I hope at least I'm conveying a little bit to others based on my tone and, and, and whatnot. Video is a, what's, what allows that. If we were doing it on the phone, I've got again, habit and muscle memory of doing that, but there's almost no way to do that in chat that's sufficient. We can all try the emoji approach. We can overly convey it with the emojis but there's just something a lot simpler about doing it on video. And if you think about that from um, um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to save cycles when you're working and become more efficient. I say you need to escalate from chat to video almost instantaneously if you feel that there is any sort of vectoral offset between you and somebody else. And the reason why is that if you let those small problems linger, they become larger problems. So if there's a miscommunication or some sort of drift happening, jump to video right away, or at least jump to a phone, but then video is another escalation point. But if you're gonna stay in chat, there's likely gonna continue to be drift. It just happens, it's natural. And uh, on your teams, the different uh, companies you've been at with that are, are, are distributed, is it, a, are the tools, whether it's, it's we're gonna use iMessage or Slack or, or, or Zoom or Google, um, are you mandating the tools to use or are you just saying use video, use chat, use email, yeah. figure out the way that's, that, you, that you want to use it. I, I have a couple of basic rules when it comes to this, which is you can make team local decisions so long as you understand the company APIs. So example being, I don't care if you do all of your project management in Asana or something else, so long as you know that we are a transparent product development company and all project status and requirements are kept in this system. And therefore, you might have to do double bookkeeping to put your project management into, into the company's project management. And if you're fine with that, go nuts locally to experiment and just double book it. Um, similarly, uh, if you don't want to use Zoom, that's great. You can use Hangouts. You can use whatever for your local team as long as everyone's on the same page. But once we do an all hands and it's Zoom, as an example, you log into Zoom. You're not going to ask us to run three different communication channels at the company level to do that. So um, again, you can experiment locally, um, but as long as you know the company APIs. Now, however, I do recommend if you are small enough to do, you just basically mandate those tool sets because you'll find that the inefficiency drift is too high. At you know, Microsoft, as an example, which is obviously the, the largest end of a spectrum, we've got 15 or 16 different video protocols, but we all log in with Microsoft Teams when we're talking to each other across departments, because we know that's the one blessed protocol. And then last question for me, and then I'll, I'll open up to the audience. Um, 
you know, how much, how important is it and how much have you encouraged on these teams for sort of non-formal communication? So, you know, we're outside of our status check-ins and our team meetings and our end of week show and tell. Um, why don't you guys, you know, Nils is the mayor of lunch in our office and, and often uh, sits at a, a table alone and people just congregate around him and he regales us with his stories. How much do you encourage that when it, when it doesn't exist in, in, a, in a remote environment? This is probably the hardest part um, for to go from a co-located to a distributed company to understand is that water cooler we call it or the lunch table or the, the serendipitous meeting at the snack bar or whatever it be. And um, I think what you do is you end up finding different mechanisms for it. I see a lot of GitHubers um, kind of give each other shit in Twitter, like weirdly now, like they kind of go there and they, they hang out on some thread or, um, or something else. Um, I like to see some, you don't, want, you don't want forced fun. You don't want people to mock it and it become a forced fun environment. You almost want it to kind of organically happen. But what I do recommend is that people have uh, five or 10 minutes at the beginning of meetings to do all social chit chatty type of stuff in a way that is, um, you should be a good meeting protocol in a lot of cases anyway to build rapport, but it's more important remote. So because you, you don't get the same sort of inorganic conversations going. Good example, actually, Fro and I just caught up. Um, he's waving, with, I'm not on video. But he and I just caught up. Um, we met each other a couple of weeks ago, and we were just having a random catch up. And we just spent 45 minutes talking basically about basketball, which is going to go a long way in whatever relationship Fro and I have going forward, because we, now we have this very shared framework of, com of communication and conversation. Now, that's management 101 in general. Fro is a very good CEO, apparently, because he was trying to connect with me to figure out how best he's, to have he's these. Just from, he's just from Kentucky and doesn't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> but it's a really good short, shortcut. But now we have this shared context by which we can actually communicate. I encourage that at the beginning of most meetings in general. And I encourage if you can get some inorganic way to do that, like force a team stat, uh, um, not a team, uh, a team status meeting, but like a team meeting where you can just make half of it, um, what's going on, some personal stories, some funny anecdotes, um, that sort of thing. And then the other half about business, you know, it's a good way to, to kind of uh, get some of that back. And uh, I said that was my last question. I was just reminded of another one as a text came in while, while you're talking. Um, how do you keep people paying attention? Um, you know, it's without, without coming off as, as um, too much of the uh, uh, fun police about, hey, pay attention, <laughs> you know, get off Twitter or whatever it is where, you know, this is valuable time. How do you build that discipline? Uh, again, especially where, you know, this is, these are a lot of people doing this for the first time. Um, watch the room. I have this in gallery mode right now, by the way, and it doesn't really work because everyone's on, um, doesn't have their video on. So I have it on gallery mode when there's a rule that everyone has to have their video on when we're doing one of these. And I just try to watch, making sure that, um, you know, people are engaged. Now, um, that said, there was an interesting um, uh, rule at GitHub, which was, you want me to pay attention to your meeting, make the meeting worthwhile for me to pay attention to. This is an early GitHub rule, which I found fascinating because obviously it means that the person who's running the meeting and doing this ha has a responsibility too. And I, I like that. I like the fact that you sh this should be worthwhile for the people partaking in it as well. So it's not just a one-way street, it's a, it's a two-way street. I will do that. I will do my best to make sure it's engaged and relevant and, um, and people should, be, should want to be there and should need to be there. And the other is my ask is that people do pay attention and engage and, and, um, and, and be part of the conversation. They'll think if they can't and they're not because it's irrelevant to them, I'm not going to fault them on that. Though I am going to then say, hey, you missed something in that meeting, you weren't paying attention later, that's a different conversation too, because you, you do know those things. Um, and you catch each other. I mean, I bought, I mean, I've been in exec meetings at GitHub where I bought shoes. I mean, I like, I will flat out say I'm a sneaker, sneaker guy and I bought sneakers because that meeting was dreadfully boring. Um, and I've also know that there are people who have been in my team meetings and they bought sneakers and you know, it happens. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm going to open it up to the audience. I'm, I'm, I'm reading questions, a couple of questions that have been chatted to me. I'll, I'm going to actually call on the questionnaire to, to articulate the question themselves so that I don't screw it up. 
Um, Elena from Coho up in Toronto, um, you're the first in the inbox. Um, do you want to grab the mic and ask the question? Make sure you're not on mute. Sure. Hey. Uh, so I, a question I had is uh, basically um, when you're remote, you want to over communicate, but yet you don't want to have too many meetings, especially with your engineering team. So you want to have this right balance where you communicate effectively. That's it. Like jumping on video definitely helpful because you see the person, you see the, you know, the contact, how the body language, etc. So how do? What's your rule of thumb? How when to schedule meetings? Where the slack, and how to keep it uh, more effective? Um, so a couple of things that would be helpful for me to know, and then I'll give a general guideline. So Coho in general, how big are you all? Like how many uh, people in the company, engineering team, all that sort of stuff. So about 100 people in the company, about, I guess, 40 engineers. Okay. So you're sufficiently large. Let's just call it that at that point then. Um, so I tended to take uh, an approach of, um, I have days of the week for certain activities, typically. It's uh, how I have, over the years, come to construct my calendar. Um, but one of the rules I instituted at Heroku, and then we had a GitHub as well, was Tuesday and Thursday were tried to be no meeting days. Um, Thursday in general was always a no meeting day. It just always was going to be a productivity day. Um, but how I've typically constructed my calendar now is, uh, remember I'm the CTO of a company that's about 2,500 people at this point, so it's a little different. But Monday is exec day. So basically Monday we do all exec meetings. We do um, you know, exec status meeting, we do exec one-on-ones, we do review meetings, which are like you know, product leadership review meeting, go-to-market review meeting, um, uh, a financial review meeting, um, and special projects review meetings. And those are when teams come to us, the exec team, and, and show, show statuses and that sort of thing. Tuesday, I do the exact same thing, but for my departments. And then in my calendar now, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday mornings, or Friday afternoons, I'm sorry, are all work meetings. So I try to schedule any meetings on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday afternoon. And then if we have to do a status update demo meeting, it happens Friday mornings. So if you think about that right there, what I'm asking of myself and my teams is that we get all of the planning meetings done Monday, Tuesday, to keep Wednesday, Thursday as free as possible. And then what you do is if you need a special meeting inside there, you, you pull it up as quickly as possible, as lightweight as possible, and shut it down the same way, as quickly and lightweight as possible. Thank you. I think uh, in a way we are approaching it similarly, but, uh, and we did try no speaking day, but it seems like meetings keep creeping in. Well, so, so don't make it a hard fast rule, which is like, we need to talk, but it's a no meeting day. Therefore we can't meet. That's not the spirit right. of that day. The spirit yeah. of that day is that I'm not going to put a status review meeting or like we need to talk about your TPS reports type of uh, thing on that day. It's a keep this thing free for people to go do whatever the deep work they need to do is. And if, but yeah. part of that deep work is also, if we need to talk, it's fine. That ha that's part of that deep work. Thank you. Uh, Fro, you've got a question and, and I wanna specifically highlight the, the question of, ask your question, but it's specifically around how to prevent office politics um, in, a, in a work from home environment. Yeah, the, so the context, well, first of all, I think it's perfectly, uh, perfectly reasonable to talk about uh, basketball, no matter where you're from, Robert. Uh, but the uh, question's really about, and you just kind of spoke to it a little bit, which is how much of what we talked about throughout the, the brunt of the address applies to executive interaction, and what are kind of like the best tips on how executives should be making sure they don't lose each other's kind of important projects and the main objectives of the business. I find myself talking at least five X as often to our executive team, mostly over the phone in my case, uh, since we've been work from home, just make sure everybody's tightly synced. So as I learn a new piece of information, it's immediately going back out the door uh, to the rest of the executive team. So there's a ton of over communication there, but it's been kind of laborious. And then a piece of that is also to keep the executive team from kind of wandering off and uh, beginning to cowboy into pet projects that nobody's really got an eye on because of uh, the kind of newness of work from home. So office politics slash um, kind of rogue agent acting prevention. So I think like, I think in general, my, my approach to this is, um, again, going back to um, uh, 
in a tactical way versus a you would have invested in this over the long term sort of way. In a tactical way, uh, the newness of the situation allows you some liberties. So like, hey, I, I've noticed a behavior that's formed because we're now in this environment. I don't, I'm not super comfortable with it. You can have some interesting conversations that way. It allow, it, it, in many ways, it's kind, kind of liberating. If you, if, you, if you already had an entrenched behavior in an organization that you don't like, you can call it out now, Be just like carte blanche. You've got like as much freedom as you want to do. The other is in a um, remote environment, I don't think the politics necessarily are worse in a remote environment. You just might be more caught off guard by it because you don't see the, the huddled conversations by others in the office. However, um, I'm reminded of two, uh, two quotes that I think about when I think about organization building. And politics to me is all about organization building. Um, in politics in general, um, the, the two quotes are um, uh, Struck and Meyer, I believe it was, it says, you reward the worst behavior in your organization that you're willing to tolerate. So if you're going to start rewarding people for politics or whatever, think about that becoming the new low, low bar of your organization. And the other one is Eleanor, um, Eleanor Roosevelt had a quote, and I'm going to butcher it because it's not in, uh, in the forefront of my frontal lobe, which is um, uh, great minds talk about ideas, average minds talk about events, and small minds talk about people. Now, if you think about that, politics typically are about people. And... An average organization will start talking about events, whether that's a competitor or a thing that's happening. And great companies will end up talking about ideas and like philosophies and wanting to get out and do all that sort of stuff. Think about where your organization is having most of your conversations and what you're seeing. And if they're talking about people, then you have politics. And how you combat that is by redirecting. Redirect one level up. Start talking about events. Start talking about whatever the event is or whatever. And then redirect. Once you're at events, redirect to ideas. And once you're able to redirect that, you will slowly eat your organization up the ladder each time. Um, but when you, you also said something very specifically about a lot more phone conversations that you're having with the exec team. Um, one, I'm an introvert by nature. I'm like not a very uh, extroverted person at all. And um, one of the things, one of the habits I had to form but when I was first remote was what I call the habit of picking up the phone, but now a Zoom or video which is the moment I feel that we have diverged from a conversation, I get more people on the call, not just two. I don't do pairwise conversations almost by nature anymore. I do th two people with me or three people with me because I wanna hear, have people hear the same thing at the same time and have that shared context. And if I see people then take that conversation and come back around to me one-on-one, -on -one, I redirect it again back into a group meeting. And the reason why is that I'm, I'm not trying to reward any sort of back channel and I'm not trying to have pairwise conversations the entire time. I'm trying to have as high fidelity as, as group-wise conversations as possible. Now that sucks because you've got a phone calls easy, merge thread, even on iPhones that hangs up like 15 times out of 16, it feels like these, time, these days. But that's the habit you start, start having to build. Helpful, man, thanks. Elena, you, you have a, uh, another question. Yes, hi. Uh, one more question. So did you notice when the teams went working remotely um, that it starts to be like people start working in different hours? For example, you, normally when you go to the office, you know, 9 to 5, uh, 9 to 6, that's the core hours. And then everyone goes home. They're, most of the people still catch up to check. But now that we are all remote, I find that sometimes they're – more people working on the weekends or later in the evenings or early in the morning when they find you know and find more time to like you know if there is a sunshine because of quarantine going out you know in the middle of the day how do you like do you encourage do you like try to create a bit more structure do you also ask people to over communicate for example if you am stepping out guys i'm out i'm going to be back and catching up What's your best approach here? One hundred percent, you should be communicating to your team or your or whoever you're accountable for in the organization that you're not going to be available during normal business hours. That's just like good habits to do. Use um whatever it is, whatever mechanism is that you communicate that to your team. Now, I would I would bifurcate between the two situations that we or the situation we find ourselves in, like COVID nineteen versus normal distributed behavior. So just, this is not business as usual for distributed companies. This is messed up. Like you've, I've got people in San Francisco that are two um, professional information workers um, who have three kids in a one-bedroom apartment because 
both people worked in the office typically and had their kids at school. Now there's five people in a one bedroom apartment. That's not business as usual. Like everything about that situation is messed up. So I don't expect the same sort of things at the moment that I do out of a normal situation. But what I do expect is that people are professionals and they communicate what they are able to do and achieve. And I expect that um, to some degree, they're gonna have lost productivity, but they're also going to do their best to make up for some of that and, and as well. I don't have a hard and fast rule about times. I don't expect people to log on by eight and I don't expect them to stay until six, but I expect that they get their work done. And that is about the habit of building that V as well. And if I know that that work is getting done, I'm actually okay with it. Um, that's uh, what I, I try to overly communicate. Now, will people abuse that? People will abuse anything. So the job of your organization too is to treat, you gotta train your organization in many different ways as you scale it and build it. Sometimes you got to train it to reject people who are not contributing to the broader sociological good of your company as well. And sometimes that means that people that abuse certain policies will no longer be welcome at the company. Just the nature of the business too. I also, I would not overly prescribe your company assuming that you're going to get the outlier bad behavior reined in. Try to get the, the broader broader set of people and give them as much liberty and freedom autonomy as possible and then slowly get the rest of the people away from your company if that makes any sense uh qu questions from jake at gecko do you want to jump in make sure you're off mute oh hey jake how you doing good jason good to see you again man thanks for uh, taking time out no um yeah a couple questions um you can decide what well let me ask one for if we have time, I can get to the second. Don't want to take up too much. But what frustrates you the most about work from home? And how do you solve for these frustrations? Um, so I, for me personally, um, work from home has been career limiting. As weird as that is to say as a GitHub, CT, um, a GitHub CTO, I do think that working from home has um, put a ceiling on what I could do. Um, but I don't. that's not what you're asking. Um, but that's still my biggest frustration with doing it. Um, I do think that um, work from home is harder on you to communicate up. So also, and a broad sweeping statement here, understand that there is a stress that comes working remote with people that report to you, not the other way around. So you're gonna want to, I, I talked about micromanagement before, just assume that people are stressed out already. And there is a tax that comes with communicating up because I, when I say over communicate, I don't mean just down, I mean down, sideways and up. And that over communication in all factors is hardest up because it's you're the most careful when you're communicating up to your boss. So in that regard, that one is um, always been the hardest because I assume that my boss knows less than I do about every topic that I'm about to communicate to them because I'm the domain expert and I'm trying to give them the context for making other decisions or status updates. And I know I'm gonna get some inane conversation back. So I try to offset that by overly communicating. It just, it's just laborious. The, the other thing that also has frustrated me about working remote when it comes to communication is that um, I do find that the, the longer you go, the laxer communication gets. So part of my job is making sure that that V continues to collapse and be as narrow as possible because entropy sets in an organization. Organizational entropy is real no matter what, but in the remote context, basically the V gets wider and wider and wider. And as that V gets wider, it's harder to pull it back. So I have to constantly be vigorous about making sure that the communication is happening back up. It, it feels that does feel like micromanaging. That's why I don't do it out in the open. I have conversations with my folks about like, I've got an uneasiness about what's happening here. Let's walk through this. Let's tighten that up. Let's have that sort of um, uh, communication. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. And then uh, Robert, if, I'm, if it's okay to ask one more. Um, all right, cool. Um, and, and with uh, with so many uh, companies um, like draft, like just getting thrown into work from home, what's like the fastest ways that you found to help ramp um, you know new employees into work from home environments? Uh, any hacks that you can share um, for us? Um, well, onboarding um, uh, is obviously going to be incredibly important here. And if you have not, if you've not been a write it down culture type of company already, which is um, 
you know, whatever the context is of zero to production for your um, person being brought in, like zero to production for a marketing person, zero to production for an engineer, like that pathway needs to exist entirely. And if it's not written down and it's tribal, you're in trouble. So write it down, take the time, make it part of what you're doing right now. Um, an example uh, is one of the, the portfolio company that I was working with Drive um, when I first joined, I went and talked to an engineer and I just said, hey, show me how you push code to production on the first day. Like actually like this is, it's not written down. I said, if step one right now is to write it down, like how you get from your machine to production, because if you are the only engineer in the company that knows how to do that, you'll never onboard somebody else. You'll never have time to onboard somebody else to that as well. So I think when you're ramping up somebody, whatever is written down becomes the, well, how they learn, or they're going to go talk to two or three other people and they'll pull those people back. So if your written communication and onboarding is tight enough where someone can go from zero to production, like pushing code to production or launching a marketing campaign, it's likely that you've got your shit on lock type of deal. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to be a jerk and sneak one more in, Robert. Uh, what kind of like social things do you do? Like, do you do any hackathons at GitHub, like remotely? Do you do any like uh, video game like session? Uh, like, what, what kind of like fun stuff do you do? Like that's like it's all kind of in, um, organic again. So like uh, the forced fund method that we do is I send out lots of swag, but I do it not for the individual, the, the family member. I do it for the, or the employee. I do it for the family. So I do a lot of that stuff. So um, I do a lot of kid things. If they've got kids or spousal stuff, like uh, in a non lockdown scenario, I try to give people things that let them go out for dinners or things with their partner, because if you're asking them to spend nights and weekends working on a project or a tight deadline, you want to reward the spouse or the partner, not the individual with money. Um, and then I do a lot of kid stuff. So like we, I had stuffies, um, uh, Octocat stuffies made and um, clothing and stickers and fun stuff like that, that I just send out to the kids all the time. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of f uh, GitHubers, you know, sure, I'm not Robert, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm in my forties, so it's different for me, but like, uh, um, a lot of 20 somethings are playing video games or 30 somethings are playing video games or, uh, doing like Fortnite sessions where they're basically just communicating about whatever their interest er is and stuff, you know? Um, but you know, we have, a we used to have a fantasy football league. Um, you know, a lot of us would do that. Uh, or a fantasy baseball basketball thing we do watching parties believe it or not of like we'd watch the same um basketball game or movie and we would chat with each other um you know that that was interesting still not the same as mystery science uh 3000 wherever that is uh, type of thing but it works you know jake you, you did remind me of a good question though um some of our companies are hiring people now having never met them in person. Um, I imagine that's something you did a lot at your companies. You know, what are some uh, things you need to do uh, for that, for hiring to be effective when you're, the whole process is. Yep. Yeah, this is, um, this is, might be the most frequent conversation, uh, uh, question I got in the last two or three weeks. Um, I think it's because people are petrified that they need the in-person to evaluate somebody one or two to get a good sense for whether or not they're a culture fit um my recommendation is to change your hiring process um in general and my answer to this is going to be the whatever what i usually recommend people go to for hiring processes um most people do a linear kind of hiring process talk to person talk to recruiter or whatever talk to head of or talk to engineer or marketer person, but these are all one-on-one -on -one conversations. And it's kind of like this stepwise thing that goes, and then ultimately a package is formed and a decision is made, or maybe there's a short circuit in, in the middle of there. The one thing I recommend to do if you're doing a distributed environment, um, to the subtle change is no single conversations happen with a person unless they're a C-level executive that's being hired. And then you can have individual conversations because those are a little bit more sensitive. But if you're hiring an engineer, have two people on the call with the person at the same time, always. And the reason why is because you're trying to create a shared construct for that person. And those two people have a context. They have the company that they're working for. The questions form another thing that they can kind of calibrate on. But if you're doing it singular, you lost all of that. And you're trying to communicate over each time. That subtle little change dramatically improves hiring across the board universally. In an environment like this, it's like the easiest, simplest thing I can recommend people do. 
I also think that um, a, another uh, recommendation is to get to decision as quick as possible. Um, if, you're, if your interview process and pipeline takes you a month to get through for five candidates, basically it's a survival mechanism. You're, you're gonna take someone who survives all the way through that. But if you can get to a decision on a candidate, a yes, no, independent of other candidates in a week, as an example, you probably are, are going to make a good decision. Again, assuming you're, you're pairwising a lot of those conversations. That's awesome. And that, that's it on the questions uh, that I've gotten so far. Um, this has been really great. Uh, I, I'm really grateful for the time uh, and, and for what you've shared today.